I'm John Burnett, mostly known for the name Leonard, which is my middle name, which was the company that I started in 65. At a very interesting time in history in terms of the rock industry, possibly the most exciting time to ever have been in this industry. And that period between 1965 to 72, a seven year period, just happened to be the most creative and the most diverse era of music that ever existed in human history. We didn't think about being inspired, we just thought about being where the action was, just finding a place to be, what to do. There was no, it was in an era when no one thought about, the group that we were, thought about what we wanted to do or where we were going or what was even the purpose to life. All these things and these type of questions came later, much later. The first mistake I made was not to come to Melbourne. It was in, Sydney was where I ended up and that's where Leonard was based. We intensely believed by the year 2000 that this whole world would be transformed by the principles of sex, drugs and rock and roll. And sex simply meant liberation. It just meant freedom to be who you are. Uh, we, we, we laugh about the situation of people at that time just taking their clothes off and running around naked. But why not? <laughs> if that's what it was, just to be free. And, you know, the, the, the second part, drugs did not represent just going off and just taking all drugs that were just available. It actually represented responsibility. Because we believed at that time any society controlled by prohibition could certainly not be responsible. And rock and roll simply means, means creativity, uncontrolled by political or religious influences. So what brought me back to this industry was the death of my son. Many of my generation, the vast majority of us that were part of that creative world at that time, when the corporate control took over, and after 1984, when it all became taken that way again, we did not go back to this industry. But during the 80s and 90s, when my son would talk to me incessantly about what it was like to attend a concert, the fact that he couldn't hear the words in the songs, the fact that the sound sounded so terrible, that it was just deafening, that it was just noise, that the, the environments that were being played in, no one cared about how bad the environment, how reverberant or echoey it was. No one even gave any thought to the acoustics of it. It was just simply the money that drove it. And he begged and pleaded with me to come back into this industry to pick up from where we left before. I just refused. I said, this is not possible. It's not my, it's, it's, the, it's the next generations that have to do that. It was shortly after that time he died. It was an accident. So, those of us that have lost children, if we want to move forward, then what we must always do for that, who that person was that died, to still be there is to continue with what they would have wished for us to do had they still been living. And in that he lives. So this is what I'm doing now. I'm continuing from where we left off in the late 70s. There was a team of us that wanted to bring about a standardization as to how amplified music is heard. There is no standardization at the moment in how it's heard. It's a complete mess. There is no two venues that sound alike. There is no two sound systems that sound alike. There's no two ways in which people mix sound that come to any agreement about what they should be doing. And what needed to be done at that time, which we were driven to achieve, was to bring standardization to this world of sound and how we hear it, how we hear amplified sound, how we end up experiencing it. Because the end result of what, if we're attaining to what is true, deeply true, then we are, our passion is to create something for it not to exist, and that is for the sound system to be totally and utterly transparent and only the music being heard.